Welcome everyone, I'm Rick Bonkowski, and this is the Amped Up to 11 podcast. We are very, very fortunate today. We have Tina Hurley with us. Uh, Tina is a uh, LBK, left below the knee amputee. And um, she is someone that I actually have been following for a long time. Uh, She is someone that I would consider to be truly one of the most amazing comeback stories. So when you start doing a deep dive into different notable amputees and what they've done with their lives and how they've transformed themselves and, and sort of the, the winding path, let's call it, that most amputees go through, um, Tina's story is truly remarkable. So I want to welcome you, Tina, to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the opportunity to, to share things and for that incredible introduction. It's uh, humbling. Thank you. Oh, it's very heartfelt. And, you know, I was saying to our last guest, um, one of the coolest things about what I'm doing with this podcast is I get to talk to my heroes. And it's really been an extraordinary experience because so much of your story and your path and the things you've been through um, personally, professionally, have served me very, very well in my own journey and bringing me to this particular place. So I always think of it like, because I'm a musician, it's like I'm, I'm meeting like rock stars, you know, like I'm sort of starry eyed and, you know, this is the person that, you know, got me out of bed that day, or this is the person that put me on a bike that day. And all of that has been incredibly gratifying and again, I am I am so appreciative of you being here. Um, I think the place that I want to begin with you specifically, um, like I said, I've followed a lot of your story. I, I want to talk a little bit about where this journey sort of started for you, but to also make mention of your life, how it looked in your mid-20s in that it would seem that around that time in your life, in your mid-20s, you were kind of on top of the world. I mean, you had a lot, a lot going for you, a lot in place. Um, Your trajectory, let's call it, was really, really gaining steam and momentum. And um, obviously things changed, but can you can you describe for me you know what that time in your life was like yeah you know i um grew up the blue collar life you know parents that i have a big military family and everybody was sort of paycheck to paycheck and um just struggling to get by and you know we would go to do something and it was always kind of like what does it cost is one of the first questions and Um, my parents did a great job, you know, raising three kids and getting us involved in athletics. And that was really how I had defined myself and kept mostly out of trouble was just staying as active as possible and was a really, um, high level competitive gymnast and, um, cheerleader and had graduated from a D1 school where I had done cheerleading for that and a travel team and just was pretty accomplished in that realm and had gotten into CrossFit and was doing really well at that. And, um, I had gone to school for, uh, eight years college to become a physician assistant with um, two things in mind. The first was I, I knew I always wanted to help people and this allowed me that opportunity. And the second was I knew that it provided a comfortable lifestyle so that I could not have to um, bring up a family in the same sort of challenging way financially. And I lined every duck up and I went to school for it and I graduated summa cum laude and I had gotten a job at a local hospital as a physician assistant in a job that I had done a rotation in. And just, it seemed like every door that I had approached the knob on just swung open. And I felt like I was on the right path. I felt like all of my hard work was really paying off, that I had very clear focus for my future. I had gone on a trip and I'd met the man of my dreams and 
um, in a pool in Vegas that happened to live two miles from my home in Manchester and had a great profession wow. and head on, on his shoulders. And so everything was just um, in that sort of perfect, like you said, trajectory. I, I had a stable job that was going to be a profession I could do for the rest of my life and fulfill myself. I had a person that I was going to spend my life with and I was very, very physically capable, sort of at the pinnacle of my fitness in my mid twenties competing in CrossFit. So things were as good as they could be. I had just bought a brand new car. I was, I was really suffering nothing and I wasn't struggling and I, um, you don't so, know you're in the glory days when you're in them. Right. But oh, I was sure. in those. Yeah. But t- to some degree, you know, you had worked for it. So you came from a family, humble beginnings, and you did what most parents want for their children. They want their their children to do better than they've done and want to achieve and to progress. And you took that ball and you just ran with it. And you said, I'm going to grab every opportunity I can. And you really did some remarkable things with your life in an early age. And, and I think the, the analogy of, you know, I, I put my ducks in a row. You know, I made good decisions. I got an education. I started my life. I, I, I met the, the man of my dreams. I was doing the things that any parent would say, gosh, you know, th- these are the things I want um, for my kid. And, um, you were obviously doing this uh, in a very, very, you know, uh, sort of zest for life, passionate way, grabbing the bull by the horns kind of attitude. Um, but then it seems like your story took a turn in that you started developing some physical symptoms. Um, given that you were a highly athletic person and, you know, winning championships and CrossFit and, you know, doing some of these really, really high level fitness type of, of situations, um, you started experiencing some symptoms. What were they? My legs just felt heavy at first. It felt like my, from my knees down, my legs just didn't have stamina. So, um, almost like if you blew a, a blood pressure cuff up around your arm and then had to do a, a set of bicep curls. It's mm. just, you know, each rep became harder and harder and harder to the point where if you're holding a five pound kettlebell, it felt like, you know, 600 pounds. It was just my legs wouldn't take me far or fast and I would have to stop really often. My feet would go numb. And then for days after doing pretty, I think, minimal activity, with those symptoms and pushing through those symptoms, my legs would hurt for days afterwards, like hard to get my heels on the floor, my calves and my lower legs were so sort of just tight. Yeah. And I would think given your regimen as an athlete and being an active person, I I would think that would be super confusing, almost in the space of what's going on here. And yeah, coming I mean, from as an athlete, but also as a medical clinician, you what know, I was going to say, coming from yeah. medicine, you know, so so much of that science, um, I, I would think that your process from a mental standpoint would have been just you're hyper crunching information at that point. I mean, you're 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 waking up thinking about it, going to bed thinking about, okay, what's happening? What's happening? What was what was the journey medically when you started trying to obtain a diagnosis that could give you the path ahead? Yeah. So, you know, I did what everybody else would do initially, just thought that it was calf cramping. I needed to eat more bananas. I needed to have more, you know, electrolytes because I was really active. Maybe my shoes were wrong. I was a gymnast, so I wasn't like running Mm. accurately. So I got a running coach and I did pre-fatiguing and, you know, all these different kind of PT movements, grass and manipulation on my lower legs and um, ate all the bananas and took all the supplements and nothing was helping. And after exhausting all of those conservative approaches and still having, you know, a crescendo pattern of my symptoms, I first sought out um, orthopedics because I was already established from some pre- uh, existing knee conditions. And I told them about my symptoms and they said, well, I mean, you're really muscular, so you may have compartment syndrome. Um, from the muscle exceeding a space and 
Uh, the way to sort of test for that is this invasive sort of archaic uh, test procedure where we stick needles in the four compartments of each of your lower legs. And then we have you walk or jog on a treadmill until you get symptoms. And then we repeat that you know, insertion of the needles and we can tell how much pressure is in there. And if the pressure is over a certain amount, you have the diagnosis. And if not, it's um, it's not the case. And then we can search for other explanations. So at first, the PCP I had seen had done like ultrasounds to make sure there was no blood clot. I was diagnosed um, inaccurately with just like calf strains. And, um, um, you know, it was to even get to the orthopedic point of diagnostic imaging, you know, you're talking about six to eight months because so you're did they not think you were just like you were kind of like working out too much or like you're pushing yourself too hard i mean was that sort of a yeah yeah hypertrophy is one of the things right increased muscle mass if you have more stuff in the space that's tight then it's more likely to cut its own blood supply off which is this compartment syndrome mm -hmm. um or some people are just born with you know small fascial compartments and it can be one of the one or the other or both and no one really knows so they had done the tests. The tests were wildly positive. So they said, all right, you've got this chronic exertional compartment syndrome. And the way to fix it is to kind of give your legs gills and cut you from knee to ankle on, a, you know, three different places in each of the legs. But the recovery is a lot. And only one out of three people really do get, um, you know, market improvement. And mm. I thought, man, that's a low, that's a low good outcome for someone that aesthetically at the time didn't have a lot of scars and didn't want to undergo that invasive of a procedure. So sure. then my mother had just had stents placed in the arteries of her groin and she happened to manifest with the same symptoms. So I just, you know, I worked in medicine. So I talked to a vascular colleague and I said, Hey, what about, what about this? And they said, you know, rare things, but peace of mind is important. And I think that that was one of the most uh, brilliant comments I've heard from a medical clinician um, was peace of mind's important. And so I saw a vascular surgeon and they tried to get pulses in my lower leg and in my feet. And at rest, they were bounding, which is normal. And then when I just point my toes down and engage my calves, um, everything goes away from the knees down. And so he tried it with a Doppler and he's trying to listen for the sound and there's nothing. And he rolled back and he said, I think you have a zebra. And um, so in medicine, you always say, if you hear hoof beats, think of a course, because they're more common. So when he rolled back and said that, I knew that we were in for a bit of a journey. And that's kind of when um, things started to really uh, fast track. You know, it was uh, lots of tests, CTs with dye, and then angiographies where they insert um, tubes into your groin and they light it up with dye underneath all these machines and to confirm the diagnosis and to look at surgical landing marks, because this is... Um, Really, it's only a surgical correction. That the diagnosis was confirmed as popliteal artery entrapment syndrome with secondary compartment syndrome. All that just means wow. that the nerve artery and vein behind the knees are trapped two centimeters above both the joint lines when my calves are engaged. Wow, that's. Um, I'm not going to try to repeat that um, because that's a that's a tongue twister. So. If you were going to put a, from, from a medical point of view, um, if you were going to put a sort of a percentage of people that have this um, particular condition, I mean, is this, I'm assuming it's unbelievably rare. Yes or no? Yeah, it's really rare. It's probably widely underdiagnosed. Okay. And, um, and it's, there's not a ton of studies. I mean, there's some folks that have written studies about it, but it's, um, it's rare enough where there's really only now becoming a few people in the country that even have seen enough of it to feel confident doing the surgical processions. Wow. And during that time that you're going through these tests and you are um, trying to reach a settled place in diagnosis, are you, um, you're still working, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so I had transitioned from hospitalist work. Uh, the good thing about PAs is you can kind of move laterally um, with on-the-job training. And I actually transitioned into a vascular surgery and wound care practice so that I could be the expert in this realm for myself and for my mother's advocacy. And it was a double-edged sword for sure. But I was a, in addition to running the clinic in this vascular practice, I was actually in the OR as a first assist, performing a variety of operations, including amputations regularly. Whoa, whoa, and whoa, whoa, so whoa. I was second. on cut. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, yeah. I gotta back up. And I don't mean to make you know light of it. Um, you know, I'm an amputee myself, so I can, I can be, I can chuckle sometimes. 
you were assisting with amputations. Yeah, I was a surgical first assist performing amputations when I was going through the diagnosis and amputation of my own leg. That's extraordinary. I mean, that, that nugget of your story, to me, is, is just, it, it, it's almost phenomenal because can you, how can I phrase this? Can you help me understand when you were in that position of, you know, being on the medical side of the fence, seeing conditions that led to amputation, actually being in the OR when those things are happening, can you even place yourself or articulate how you were feeling um, about those procedures or sort of, you know, what your perspective was? about amputation at that time. Is it possible based on all your life experience since that that time to really go back in time, so to speak, and say, well, this is how I felt about amputation at that time. Can, Can you help me understand what your perspective was in that moment? Yeah. So I found out in December of 2015 Um, only three months after I'd just gotten married that I was going to lose my leg semi-electively. I had very, I had almost no blood flow and the options were to remove the leg to improve quality of life or to, um, stay on chronic narcotics and really not be able to function. And so that was sort of a no brainer, but I sought out physicians for a number of months to try to get an ertl procedure, which is a special bone bridge that goes at the end of the limb for the purpose of weight bearing distally because I wasn't able to have compression due to my condition mm-hmm. or the leg wouldn't really be successful. So navigating those pieces was helpful in that I knew the referral sources. I knew some of the other doctors in the greater Boston area through my journey and research so that I I knew kind of who of anyone to go to, but I will tell you that when I found this out, the the lack of preparedness by way of education and medical training for not the amputation piece, you're well-versed on the comorbidities that lead to amputation, the way to uh, surgically approach amputation and the way to care from a post-operative perspective and wound care. I mean, you're, you're very well-versed in that, but the process of becoming an amputee after that, the, the socioeconomic impact, the psychosocial impact, the barriers truly to care um, and support that's needed for that person and their, their, their support systems, and also the world of prosthetics was a huge gaping hole in the knowledge that I had as a clinician and the entire institution truly that I worked for and any since then that I've seen. So there is a lot that needs to be done, and I found that out through that journey, but I was feeling out of place, which is interesting because you would think as someone that's the specialist in this, she'd be perfectly in place and the most prepared of anyone. But I, I was treating elderly, comorbid, vasculopathic, largely smoker populations. And I didn't fit that demographic. I was a young athletic person that had made good choices. And I also couldn't communicate with the people that were becoming amputees beyond the professional setting because that wasn't my role and I needed to be supportive and strong and knowledgeable for them. So I wasn't able to really connect in that way either with the folks that were becoming amputees. My role was giving them care postoperatively, taking care of them preoperatively. And um, even after my leg was just freshly amputated, I was on a knee scooter with my amputated limb rounding through the hospitals and the ICUs and providing support. Um, but I was numb. I mean, to face your future in live time every day for six months before that becomes your hmm. outcome, in order to self-preserve and to execute my job, which I needed to do not just from a sense of purpose because I was losing my identity in every other way, but also because it financially was getting me to a place where I could be a little bit more comfortable when I was going to be out of work recovering and opening up this Pandora's box. So I had to do it. And in order to have to do something that's really traumatic, you have to go to some place where you can just numb out the feelings. And you know, you kind of do that in clinical practice anyway, especially in surgery. You very much objectify the case. Everybody's draped and there's only a hole in the draping where you're working right. because to 
to operate on someone with their, them looking at you and their whole body. It's too personal. And so I just had to expand that skill set to be able to function nine to five every day. But I will tell you that behind closed doors at night and on weekends, I was a mess. Um, and I didn't have the coping tools and I didn't have um, the, I guess, the understanding of the strength and vulnerability to seek help and to get counsel, like professional counsel, yeah. to work me through stages of grieving because I went through every one of them at the jeopardy of my new marriage and, and also my own self-care. And um, it was a really maddening, is the best way to put it, it was a really maddening six months of faking being okay. I think that's um, incredibly important to highlight um, all of that talk because I often, when I do have these conversations, you know, outside of the podcast space, and I talk to lots of different amputees, there's this mental game that goes on. And so often, the outside world see, sees an amputation as simply a physical thing. It's a loss of a limb. Oh, you can get a you can get one of those cool prosthetic legs, right? Um, never really wrapping their brain around the emotional component, the sense of loss, and everything that goes with that. And and moreover, how that loss tends to at times overflow and spill into other parts of your life personally, professionally, and otherwise. Um, you know, I admire your vulnerability in that particular dialogue because so much of facing that is, is a challenge in itself to say, I was a mess or, you know, I went numb or, you know, for myself personally, uh, after amputation, I remember having um, panic attacks and all of that stress, anxiety, and sort of alarms that were going off, I could feel the pulse in my leg that was no longer there. And it would send the signal to my brain that would just, it would be like a four alarm fire. Like it's not there. It's not there. It's not there. And it would just be like a broken record. And Finding help, you know, guidance, inspiration, um, finding people online like yourself and talking to the right groups um, is such a critical piece in this journey and learning how to self-soothe and learning how to bring that temperature down in the room because so many amputees aren't equipped with that. Um, I think there's sort of this like painful fear about you know, having something taken away, but never realizing that there's sort of this wake of emotion that just is is constantly coming at you. And um, one of the things I find, you know, very, very beautiful about most of what I've uh, read and seen, you know, when you're speaking is you're, you're very revealing of that. And that goes a long way for so many of us. And um, it's a really important piece. Uh, so you're you're wheeling around, you know, um, making rounds on a knee roller. And um, what did things start to look like after that? I mean, I'm assuming at some point you're you're looking at you know getting a prosthesis and starting that journey. What was what was all of that like for you? Well, it was a, unfortunately a sort of a continued mess, which now provides me with a lot of tools and knowledge to uh, help myself and others. That's the blessing in our hardship, right? But um, I had my limb amputated in July and I had fallen in the hospital. Mm. Um, I was having neurogenic spasms of my calf and they loaded me with a bunch of meds and it made me really loopy and got up and forgot I didn't have one a leg and I had fallen on it and pulverized the tissue. and it got necrotic or dead all the way to the bone. And so they had to do a surgical debridement in the OR six weeks later. And I had a big wound back and was having like, you know, weekly debridements in the wound care center and daily wound care at home. And I was like blowing spit bubbles on pain meds. I was put on so many things to control the spasms and the medicine. I mean, doses that even clinically are striking. Um, 
just to be comfortable. And October, which is just a few months later after the initial amputation and about six weeks after my um, surgical debridement, I came home from a doctor's appointment and all of my husband's things were gone. Um, the journey had been too much and I was very far from my center. And so, so no, gone, no, 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 everything just out of the house. Um, and, uh, you know, we later had met at a counselor's office and his mind was very much made up at that point. Um, but he had agreed to meet with me to have conversations, not for the purpose of reconciliation, but f to improve, as he put it, um, communications uh, to help with basically moving on. And one of the things was the apology and the way that he had left, but that he he didn't know kind of what else to do and needed to sort of temper, I think, the guilt on his end, you know, because mm -hmm. it's a hard thing to do when you don't see your life with that person and you know that they're suffering and they need a lot of assistance. And well, this so is, I, uh, this is, I don't mean to stop you. This is, this is very personal. And you know, this is something I admire about people like yourself. I, I am in cer certainly not the same situation, but, but, uh, I, I am single. Um, you know, I'm an amputee who became single after amputation. And I, I can understand when you, when you speak in this way, what some of those components feel like. And this is something I believe that certain people can handle and we all have a capacity and it's um it's beautiful i mean it it really is in in the way that you approach it and the way that you you talk about it and to have such a a huge life change in the midst of you know what already is a storm to suddenly be faced with that and how how could you how could you do anything but just lay down and and say i you know what i'm i'm kind of done you know like yeah that's well that's exactly what i did i mean i felt like that was my safety net yeah and i you know we we look back retrospectively and we try to if we're trying to learn the lessons that hardship is teaching us rather than using them as excuses you look at that in hindsight and you figure out what pieces are yours to own and work on. And, um, you know, I had leaned into him so much for, for happiness and for yeah. validation and for love because I didn't have it for myself. And I was so out of control with respect to genuinely the control that I had in my future and my fate. And so I would hyper control everything around me, including domestically, which affected him. And I was in, I had 13 surgeries in less than three years. So I was either going into a surgery, having to deal with the perioperative time or coming out of a surgery with repeatedly negative outcomes. And that never gives you a chance to focus on the other person the other person's emotions or that work at all on the relationship because you hardly have enough bandwidth to just get yourself through every day with the pain and the continual yeah. disappointment of your life. Um, but that was, you know, when I came home, the last little tiny bit of carpet that was under my remaining foot was just pulled. And you're <sighs> right. I just, I laid down in my bed upstairs and I was there for three weeks. I couldn't eat. And because I couldn't eat, I didn't have energy to get around my home. I was having neighbors come care for my dogs downstairs. I wasn't answering any phone calls or text messages because I didn't want anyone in my life to see me that way. I was too proud to show the fragmented, unlovable, disfigured, abandoned um, person that I identified with now. And I just felt like I had fallen from grace and I just didn't know how to get out of it. I didn't know how to get my power back and was very much clinically depressed without really acknowledging it at that time. And I'm very yeah. blessed that I have good friends and family. And one of my friends had um, broken into my home and found me in bed. And the first words they said to me as they looked upon me and I was like Skeletor laying there. I mean, I was gaunt. I was in the same pajamas Skeletor. for like five days. Yeah. I had a protein bar next to me that I had eaten two bites of in three days. And they said, you're selfish. Ooh. And I remember trying Tough to mount a approach. response. Yeah, I remember trying to mount a response to that. And before I could, they said, you know, you're letting your ego and your pride deprive everybody in your life that loves you 
of the opportunity to help you at a critical point where you need it. And that's what we're all here for. You need to get up. This isn't your story. You're giving away your own power. You're choosing right now. You're choosing to suffer. Isn't it amazing that, that, of all the spectrum of choices that that friend could have made on how to um, interact with you in that very moment, being able to choose that and it being the spark that sort of woke you up, um, that's remarkable. I mean, because when you consider all the, you know, the potentialities of outcomes from let's say they came in and just wrapped their arms around you and said, it's going to be okay. Whereas that may have further enabled the state that you were in. Whereas they saw it as, I need to shock you, but bring you back into this loving, supportive orbit. And this is going to be your defining moment right now. This is when it's all going to change. Because it did, didn't it? It did. Yeah. I, I, it came from a source that I respected that knew me and my greatness before that knew my capabilities and knew that my identity had nothing to do with 10 toes and knew all of these things that I had lost in this grueling emotional and physical process. Um, and that tough love was because they knew that none of that changed just despite, you know, just because I lost a limb and it's a really good reminder to society that, you know, we're so eager to give pity and to treat people broken. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, and I know you've probably experienced this too, where you go to a whatever fast food place. I used to like have a Jeep and I'd put my stump in a little bungee cord to keep it elevated so it wouldn't swell. And I'd go get a coffee and I'd reach over my half limb to get the coffee. And I would just be met with these big eyes and this regretful face and someone looking at me going, you poor thing. Yeah. And I mean, if you get that enough times throughout your day in every direction, if you start you know, the Adaptive Training Foundation where I'd gone, you know, the owner there had said this beautiful saying that still sticks with me. Um, if you treat people broken, they eventually are going to act broken. And I was adopting the way that I was being now perceived by my community. And that is what needs to change. We, we need to be empowered and in doing so, become a beacon of hope, not just for folks with different abilities, but people with able-bodied situations. Because if we can do it, not in spite of, but because of the struggle that we go through, it encourages other people to not use the hardships they're going through as excuses. Because I feel like society just wants to enable that. And it's it's a real big flaw that we need to um, start to change. Oh, I mean, that is... Those are such wise words. And, you know, there's a lot of chatter online. There's a lot of things I see, you know, within the amputee community. That's unfortunate. And I am not denying struggle. I am not denying pain. I am not denying all of the feelings that come with this loss. You know, losing a limb is incredibly impactful. It affects everything. It affects everything every single aspect of your life. However, to enable it in terms of the pity piece, the poor me, I'm less than. One of the things I think that inspires me most about people like yourself and many of the amputees that I followed when I began my journey, and even today, even this morning, you know, I'm jumping around online this morning. These are some of the most powerful people in my opinion. These are quality humans. These are people that just take me to a place of, I can do anything. I'm on this journey and these people are my fuel. And, you know, the things that you're doing and many people like yourselves, and really the, the, the point of this show is that uplifting piece that we understand this is hard. There's struggle. But let's face it, everyone has struggle. All the two-legged freaks out there have struggle, okay? Right? And that's just the thing. We, we all carry something. There is a load that we carry in our lives. 
whether that is um, where you come from or struggle in career or struggle in relationship. But we have this power to lift each other up. And, you know, it seems like that particular point in your experience was a really, really, you know, just hard turn in a completely new direction. Because am I mistaken in thinking, is is that when less leg, more heart kind of came to the surface? Or was that just sort of a trajectory you were on that led you to that? That was um, another seed planted in the bed that eventually became watered. But at that point, I was still very much needing to get to a point of stability before I was able to really have any space for creativity or, mm-hmm. or philanthropy. Um, but, you know, the, the challenge that I kept finding was that each time I would try to come out of that pity cabin, right? Cause it's okay to visit it. There is a real, as you mentioned, loss and it affects every orb of, of your life and relationship and identity and capability. And there are so many things that you have to relearn and go through and follow up with doctor's appointments and learning how to drive again, learning how to walk again, different kinds of accessibility equipment, different kinds of prosthetics, all the different castings. I mean, you're bombarded with this crazy, rocky medical terrain that right. is one facet of a multifaceted system that you have to pay attention to, to try to become successful in this new life because everything's been turned on its head. And it was one of the moments that I recognized the power in both vulnerability and also tribe and community. It was certainly one of the most highlighted moments of my journey where those two prominent topics became just so glaringly obvious as parts of the recipe for success, Mm -hmm. even though I wasn't ready necessarily to put the formula together. And in that next 12 months, I had to have an estate sale, sell my home, rehome my two dogs. I had to have two subsequent medical revisions to my limb to go higher and higher due to lack of limb uh, wound healing. I had to have repeated prosthetic progressions. I was trying to work as the PA still in the office while I was going through all of this. I mean, it was just absolute survival mode, trying to grasp at straws to just get through the day and figure out who I am. Who, who is Tina Hurley now on one foot? Who is she without the capability of returning to surgical practice? I no longer could perform multiple hour amputations or aortic reconstructions or run around the hospital rounding because my limb wasn't stable for that. So who, who am I now in this new chapter? And what do I have for skills that are transferable to the next pages of this book that I can lean into so that I can have that purpose and that stability that we're all seeking to figure out for our lives because all of my prior planning and all of the control I thought that I had was all seemingly in that moment for nothing, although of course it isn't for nothing now that I have different lenses on. Um, But it definitely was one of the many pieces. I mean, having that unique perspective from the bed and also at the bedside as a clinician and a patient in this realm I, through unfortunately negative outcomes largely, learned so many things about the lack of communication in medical um, contexts, the lack of um, proper discharge planning in home services, the lack of social support, the almost ridiculous nature of our our expectations for a patient to independently acquire all of the resources that they need externally from what insurance affords in order for them to be successful while they're trying to grieve and mourn and adapt to this new life. Um, it's it, it, There's no wonder why all of our secondary outcomes in medical stuff that we measure like falls and narcotic use and suicidality and depression and non-compliance and all of these things are because the system lacked the peripheral support that is needed for anybody. Honestly, if amputees are one, one piece of a special population that represents anybody that has a major change to their capability, their function, and is suffering through trauma and loss. And that's really, as you mentioned, everybody. Yeah. Um, 
We're going to take a quick pause because I, I feel like we're, we're starting to segue into uh, this amazing organization, uh, Less Leg, More Heart. Um, but with that, we're just going to uh, go into our segment that we do on every podcast called Amps You Should Know. On this episode of Amps You Should Know, we're talking about Camille Zogby Jr. Camille is 59 years old. He is a right hand below the wrist amputee, and he's been an amputee for 41 years. He became an amputee through a work accident at age 18. Uh, Camille is definitely someone that enjoys his motorcycles. He's also an insur- insurance agent. We all have to have a day job. And um, I think one of his inspirations in talking to him is the strength and fortitude and the incredibly strong attitude of the motorcycle community. And I, I want to take a moment to pause and talk a little bit about the uh, motorcycle community. If you were to sort of immerse yourself into what this particular family of people are, is that they are incredibly supportive of each other, especially when it comes to motorcycle safety, uh, tips and tricks, support of each other, and especially recognizing that so many cyclists end up, um, unfortunately, with amputations due to accidents, um, not always caused by themselves, usually by other drivers. So um, I just want to say I, I, I so admire that particular community of people. Um, when I asked uh, Camille what was one of the most challenging things about being an amputee, and these are his words, He said, learning to accept my disability, to forgive myself, and learning to live with people staring at you, learning to accept help from others, and learning to be a proficient motorcycle rider. Camille, I just want to say it's a pleasure meeting you. It's a pleasure sharing your story on the podcast today. And I want everyone to know, Camille, that you are an amp that everyone should know. Hey everyone, we're back with Tina Hurley, and uh, we were just talking a little bit about the deficiencies that exist for uh, the amputee community, certainly an underserved group of people. I wanted to connect some dots as well um, with my own story. One of the things that I realized pretty quickly as a new amputee not having any of the benefits of coming from any kind of a a medical background, really in truth, not not knowing anything about amputation or prosthetics. Um, I think one of the things that I noticed right away, Tina, was that there seemed to be this great divide. Because on the one hand, I had this team of doctors, infectious disease doctors, orthopedic surgeons, you know, all of these people that could speak uh, in a very clinical way to, to what was happening, you know, with my limb. And once amputation occurred, it, it was almost as if they kind of faded away into the shadows. And suddenly I had to pivot to this whole new group of people. And I think the thing I noticed right away was this group of people over here has no idea what this group of people over here is doing. I would literally walk into one of my uh, MD's offices with my prosthesis on, and he'd say, I have no idea what that is on your leg. I don't know what it does. I don't know what challenges you face with that. I have no idea, obviously, what that feels like, but I can't give you a single ounce of advice when it comes to what's going to happen with any of that. And that support, those resources, those sort of connection points, those bridges, let's call them, that create momentum 
for an amputee, it, it seems like that is somewhat what you do with this organization. Can you help me understand a little bit more in depth um, what your mission is, um, you know, as an organization? So Les Like More Heart started in 2019 to address some of these holes, as you, as you mentioned, to create some intentful vagueness to allow for the promotion of expansive services that can be offered in a customized way. So uh, when a beneficiary comes to us, they are either impending amputation, they are still in rehab or a hospital because they just were amputated or they are post-operative at some point in their journey. Um, we take them through the same um, comprehensive intake that is something similar to a history of present illness, HPI, that clinicians do, but with a lot of expanded focus on social and economic and um, emotional um, questions to help us identify where they're at in their stages of grieving, where the barriers are to their care, where the holes are in the support, so that we really get a good snapshot of not just where they are, but who's around them and how they feel about where they are, which will affect their ability to be resourceful and effective in the next stages of their recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that intake process is done by a very seasoned um, team of nurses through the um, nonprofit. And then we award the person with some set of things out of the four pillars that we have for our assistance. The first is um, medical advocacy. We will help to um, take that clinical talk, that jargon that you mentioned, and make it more relatable, more understandable, perhaps go over the results of something that they felt they didn't really have a handle on, even after seeing with their doctor, um, help them weigh decisions, never specifically telling them what to do, but giving them a more um, straightforward uh, way of, of attacking and approaching a clinical dilemma if it's a decision or wrapping their head around something. So there's mm -hmm. that advocacy piece. Sometimes we can remote into doctor's offices, doctor's appointments, and sometimes we just provide it in our meeting with them. Uh, the second pillar of assistance is peer mentorship. So we have a few direct mentor uh, opportunities in the organization. We connect folks with folks like them and also support systems with similar support systems. And uh, we also have Heart to Heart, which is a a Zoom-based virtual peer support platform that meets the second Thursday of every month at 6 p.m. Eastern, where for an hour we have a showcase speaker talking about something relative, um, irrelevant to the amputee journey. Uh, and that's not just, as you mentioned, the physical way of limb loss and prosthetics, but also the emotional, psychological, financial, economic pieces to what they should know, what they need to know, bringing vetted resources, knowledge, goods their way, uh, and then having discussions so people can connect with each other. And then the third pillar is that we fund holistic approaches to care, which is one of the specifically vague areas. Really anything that's not a needle, narcotic, or surgery that we can justify will improve their quality of life. That might come in way of a gym membership, or supplementation or additional PT sessions because some legislative person said you only get 20 for some reason uh, a year. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's counseling, maybe it's adaptive recreation modifications for them to resume an activity that makes them identify with themselves and their power. Um, we can pitch it uh, in any way as long as it improves them. And then the fourth and final pillar is that we have uh, home service allocations for transition. So if somebody goes home with a new uh, limb amputation and their discharge team didn't necessarily set up their home for safety, we've done things like provide ramps, widen doorways, uh, in, you know, put a stackable washer dryer in a first floor closet so someone can get to it, um, redo bathrooms completely to be ADA. Those are our community service projects that we do in part partnership with local community vendors and other organizations and trades providers to try to rally around families. But we also provide in-home services that are less comprehensive because those are sort of, um, uh, I would say, competitive to get. Uh, what we can provide for more people is home services like handyman services, house cleaning things to help take care of some of the doing in the home when they transition yeah. so that they cannot... 
everyone's going to try to do it and their safety is prudent at that point, but also uh, delivery of meal services to their home for a period of weeks to months for them and their support system. Because anyone that's lost a limb knows that it's so tremendously hard to get to the grocery store, get the stuff loaded, get home, unpack it, cook it, clean it. It's almost yeah, I was say, impossible. Cook, to- cooking a meal just becomes a challenge, you know? It's impossible to eat well. And so folks don't, their nutrition suffers, then their wounds don't heal well, or their diabetes isn't well controlled. And so it ends up being a a real sabotaging situation. So out of all of those services, our intake provides us with the ability to choose the things that are appropriate for them in that moment. And then we have a follow-up team that follows up with them at one, three, six, and 12 months in the first year, and annually thereafter to continue to make awards based on a new assessment so that they continue to grow into new services, new support, new supplies, because you just can't get everything up front and be able to follow along. It's too much. It's overwhelming. And we really want this to be a digestible, palatable process where they get really what they need each sort of step of the way. It's it's really, it's it's such incredible work. I mean, when I think about you and obviously there's there's a, there's a medical background, okay? So there's some foundational stuff in that you understand medicine and and that certainly puts you at a at a at a tremendous advantage um but then becoming an amputee yourself uh puts you directly in that space N- no one can look at you and say well you don't know what it's like and then there's this emotional piece you know the struggle that you've been through yourself uh you know personally in in, in your life you know um maybe at one point even feeling like you lost your career. Um, and you talked a little bit about, you know, who am I now? You know, I, I've, I've faced that same question myself. Like, well, who am I now? You know, how, how, do I make, how do I make all this work? And when you take all of those disciplines, all of that life experience, and it seems like all of this was really just in preparation for what you do now. And when you think about, you know, not to get too cosmic with everyone, but the powers of the universe, when things get in alignment and you, th- and you say to yourself, well, well, why did all these things happen? Well, they happened for a reason. They happened because you have such a deep, deep understanding of all the different moving parts of what it's like to be in this amputee lifestyle machine and you've created services and support that will allow folks that are completely lost in the desert i mean completely lost somehow find water and to me that is just what a what a beautiful story what a blessing and what a great calling um and I would imagine that some of the some of the the success stories you see in real time now are are, are probably pretty wonderful. Yeah, you know, it's it's selfishly selfless in some sense. I feel like every humanitarian has something they get from that. And mm-hmm. you know, my journey is still ongoing. I still don't have very good perfusion in my baloney segment. Um, they're talking about more surgeries or osseo integration. I still haven't approached my other leg because I have a son that's seventeen months old that I need to get you know, a little older before I even start to poke that bear. Um, So in the midst of what could be still pretty catastrophic medical circumstances, it allows for me to stay lifted. I mean, really, you do rise by lifting others and the, the, all of this mess turned into a message and all of the, the feelings that I get about having all of the suffering that I continue to go through, not be in vain, just keeps my ball moving personally. um, Mm -hmm. And knowing that, every roadblock that I meet and every um, challenge that I'm up against, when I find out those resources, that even if it it's hard and I have to go through challenge and pain and struggle to find that thing that makes it easier or gets me through it, that I now have that thing to be able to pass forward and this organization as a platform to be able to do that and help somebody suffer less. And, you know, it's a lot to, to shoulder, but you would have to shoulder it anyway if you if you didn't have a, a nonprofit like this to put into. And so I would just, you know, encourage other folks within the disability community, if they're not already, to just get behind a cause, not just by way of donation, but really involving yourself in an organization that 
does something that speaks to your heart because it does more than just serving volunteer hours. It, it really does help to redefine your purpose, your connection, um, and and keep you at a place where you're thriving because you you can't really stay in that place of self pity for too long. I mean, all of us have gone the route of why me, you know, we've all tried that piece. I I don't think it's worked for anyone that I've talked to personally or myself, but we go through that phase of all these things. Why me? Why me? And that just gives this terrible feedback loop to promote a sense of powerlessness. And so no wonder you feel hopeless and in despair and suffering and depressed and, and frozen, paralyzed. Um, with the fear of what everyday life could be because without that certainty on the horizon that we all have an artificial sense of uh calm about because all that can change in the snap of a finger right. um without that people that uncertain that uncertainty is unsettling to folks and that is okay you know you can acknowledge that that is a feeling that everybody in the world faces whether they're limb loss or not but what you do with that is what defines you what you choose to do with the the roadblock or the uncertainty or the challenge or the the unknown is where your character comes in. And so at the end of the day, if you can just remember that your purpose is greater than having fingers and toes, you don't need literal limbs to make a mark. And I think that that was the biggest take home for me was we all have a journey and we're all here for a reason and we all have a purpose. And if we can just pay forward some of our tools, our knowledge, our compassion, our kindness, our love, the world really genuinely, as corny as it sounds, would be a better, easier place for everyone. And um, I would just encourage that. I would encourage people to reach out and find something that really lights their their flame on fire and find the things that fan it. Yeah, I, I agree. And again, incredibly wise words. I I feel like so many of us have this energy that um, is transferable, that we we possess the ability to literally save each other. Um, And taking negative energy and churning positive is really, I think, what the human condition is all about. And when I see someone in pain and I, you know, I read something online or it becomes, you know, oh, here we go, another pity party. Um, I just want to reach out. You know, it for me, it's, you know, how can I offer a comforting word? How can I, how can I lift up that person in a way that they'll understand that this is just a moment? And like you said, we are not defined, you know, by fingers and toes. You know, we are defined by what we what we gift to humanity. And so many of amputees that are in that dark space and in the why me kind of cycle, there is a way to break out of that. There is a way to make a change. And those changes start in just the smallest of ways, the teeny tiniest of ways. And I'm hoping that these types of conversations will help that reflection, just nudge it along just a little bit more to get to the right space, to a place where someone wants to get out of bed or wants to get out of the wheelchair today or, you know, is is okay with going to the prosthetist today. And yeah, I know you've been there 53 times. That's okay. Um, maybe this time is going to be, you know, a game changer. Let's, you know, let's stay focused. Let's stay in the game. Um, And maybe it's not, you know, maybe, maybe it isn't. And it is what you feel is a bit of a waste of time, but you know, you can have a terrible hand and still have a really good time at the table with your friends and family. It's like what, you know, your life follows in the direction of your, of the strongest thoughts that you have. And so if you think that you're wasting time and if you think that your life is terrible, and if you think that this is all going to be for nothing, and this is going to be another awful day, and you're presenting that energy, and those are the lenses that you're choosing to walk through your day wearing, then you will find that in your day. Right. You know, it's almost like when you shop for a white, you know, shopping for a white Jeep, and then all of a sudden you see all the white Jeeps on the road. It's like, what you focus on is what you, is what you will find. And so 
I, there was this beautiful quote that I'd heard years ago. And whenever I continue to have hard days or challenges, because you never just get to a place where you're okay all the time, right? We all, even the, the most quote successful amputees will slip back into it. Right. And you have to remind yourself that, you know, all of us listening to this have 100% success rate at getting through hard times. This is true. And so it's just a, a funny reminder that we all catastrophize um, and all of that energy is just wasted. It's And it's, I wish I could take back all of the time that I wasted on anxiety and looking back and muddling through the day with my head down and my heart heavy because none of it served me. Right. And it's, you know, and it's only by way of accepting your vulnerability, connecting, as you mentioned, with other people and learning about resources that you're able to come up on top of the water enough to really appreciate that. So, you know, coming out of the house and, and jumping onto support groups and really being okay, not being okay in order to get okay has to be something that we um, encourage more because I think that especially with the day of social media right now, everybody wants to look polished and everyone wants to have um, this presentation of strength. Like you're out to prove something. And I did in the beginning of my journey, yeah. I had to, I had to pretend I was so strong and I had everything together and, and it was proving something to myself, but it was artificial at first. I was sort of faking it to make it. And I'm lucky that I was able to, but it wasn't through those behaviors it was through allowing myself to crack around trusted yeah. people and that allowed me to fill those gaps in. So, you know, folks are listening and they're not okay. Um, that's part of it. And that means you're on the, the journey to healing as long as you don't give up and you just keep putting one foot in front of the other or one wheelchair push at a time, reaching out to organizations like mine, less like more heart or watching and listening to podcasts like yours, where there are wonderful people with beautiful stories and also great resources right. uh, are two, I think, incredible starting points. No, that, that, that's so well said. And, um, all of that forward movement, you know, comes from these, these conversations and this type of engagement. Um, what just for the audience, if you could tell us what's the website address again? Yeah, it's lesslegmoreheart.com. And if you're someone that needs assistance under the contact section, there's a form called disability assistance. That would be what would be submitted. Oh gosh, that's wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Tina. It's such an honor and a pleasure to meet you. I'm so glad you had the time today to spend with us. Um, I am wishing you all the best and, um, gosh, it's just, um, it's been so fun. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. Um, that's going to wrap it up for us. Uh, I'm Rick Bonkowski. This is the Amped Up to 11 podcast, and I want to wish health and happiness to everyone. We'll see you next time.